I think there was a, a previous title uh, that uh, might have uh, circulated on uh, responsibility. I don't know if you saw that, but uh, having realized that I was coming at the end of the day, I thought I had to give something slightly less heavy going than a formal analysis of responsibility based on uh, analogies between uh, distributed ne neural networks and uh, uh, other fancy things like that. So I thought, well, let me uh, try to give a, a more uh, uh, general uh, abstract uh, overview of some of the issues that I'm, I'm dealing with these days and that are uh, lying behind the project that has motivated this workshop. So uh, from the specific topic to the workshop, to the workshop, to the project for the workshop, to the perspective that motivated the project, the workshop and the topic. So basically what you're going to get uh, in the next uh, 19 minutes uh, or so is um, a preview of a even the old thing, but a chapter in the book that uh, concerns the overview that motivates the project, that motivates the workshop, that would have motivated the paper that I would have given. So, uh, I've, having taken all these steps back, I, I hope it will not be uh, too heavy going. And that's why you know, we start with some pictures, so it uh, uh, should be entertaining. If you haven't seen this, this is of course the usual Wikipedia. Um, uh, the gentleman uh, on uh, the uh, top right uh, is famous uh, It's Francois Leclerc du Tremblay. Uh, also known as the Eminence Greece. Um, he was the advisor of Cardinal Richelieu, who was in turn uh, Chief Minister to King Louis XIII. Why this data? Uh, first of all, because you might have read this in the Three Musketeers, so it's always interesting to know what you actually uh, encountered. Uh, uh, but mainly because uh, he was the guy who influenced uh, European uh, policy for quite a while and quite substantially. I mean, we're talking about pre-post-Westphalian uh, agreements. Uh, but he wasn't influencing the king, he was influencing the influencer who was influencing the king. So grey power has always been with us. Uh, it's just that grey power is the influencing power, but sometimes it's mistakenly taken to be the power that influences power. Uh, not really, it's the power that influences those who influence the power. So three steps back. The question that I want to ask today is, um, well, in mature information societies like uh, the UK and bits of Europe, what is the new morphology of grey power? Or to put it shortly, what is the morphology of power? And I can give away the, the answer immediately. The morphology of power is the morphology of uncertainty. You need to listen to the next 10 minutes because uh, <laughs> that sentence doesn't make any sense, uh, I hope. Uh, so remember the morphology of power and which power? The grey power, the three steps away from the real power, the forceful power with the soldiers. Uh, is the morphology of uncertainty in mature information societies. A few more steps back, classic philosophers move. What is power? And I think there was a, a already this morning, you know, we started with power, I think we end with power. There are really three kinds of power, and uh, uh, the only one of which is in question today. This poietic power, just to use a Greek word, is the power to create, annihilate something. And uh, not even uh, God in every tradition has that power. Only in some traditions, some gods have that power. Uh, then uh, uh, there is the manufacturing power, the power to transform a reality into another different reality. Uh, normally all gods have that, I mean, so even the minor of gods. Um, and then they ha you have cybernetic power in the platonic sense of cybernetic. Know, the, the guy who guides the boat in a particular direction, and it's the control over reality. Now, if that is confusing, uh, some kind of, kind of a New Testament uh, analogy here. You can create a stone out of nothing. Yeah, that's poetic. You can transform that stone into a piece of bread, uh, any reference to real events, no, purely, purely uh, accidental. Normally you transform fish, uh, no, stone something into fish and something. But, um, and that's manufacturing power. And of course, uh, you can make it fly at some point, uh, and that's cybernetic power. Now, of course, sociopolitical power is mainly cybernetic. It's not so much, and I'm not oversimplifying, generalizing, but you can see where we're going. Uh, it's not so much about poiesis, it's not creating out of nothing, and it's not so much about manufacturing, but it's very much, not mainly, a lot of it. Is doing cybernetic uh, control. If it is control, and I hope you kind of uh, agree with me, then power in the context that we need to discuss today, uh, sociopolitical 
power, it is social political ability to control, influence people's behavior through the creation control of things, goods, services, or information about things, laws, news. Well, that was the old sort of um, system. Um, we had uh, uh, people, you want to influence people, uh, the power to influence people uh, relies on creating goods and services at some point uh, or information about goods and services. In liberal societies, um, I wash with cheap goods and free information, things, information about things, they are really free and they don't, don't cost much. Uh, uh, power is changing and is exercised on something else. It's really exercise about which questions can be asked and what answers can be received and therefore transparency, privacy, right to be forgotten, freedom of speech, ownership rights, it's all about who can control the questions which then generates the information, which then influences the things, which then is used to influence behaviour. So uh, in the thesis here is that in mature information societies uh, grey power is stepping even further back into the darkness so that not only is it less visible but it's influencing things from a very very long distance in a domino effect. So the new morphology of power as I said is the morphology of uncertainty I need to tell you something about uncertainty and because we are in Oxford Alice comes uh, uh, quite useful. That's a very special Alice if you want to know more is a disturbing Alice. I hope you didn't play with that Alice, but in case I'll, I'll tell you more later. All you have to notice is that there's a skull here. So, but that's <laughs> that that kind of Alice, uh, insane, just came out of uh, the asylum, starts going around killing people. Uh, well, she she there are things that she knows, uh, things that uh, such as uh, there's a monster hiding, and that's why she's afraid. And that's her information. There are things that she knows that she does not know. Uh, where is the monster? Uh, if she knew it, uh, no, uh, she wouldn't be looking for it. So that's incipience for the uh, sophisticated among us. Or things that she's not quite sure she knows, whether her weapons is sufficiently powerful to kill the monster. We put everything together, that would be specifically uncertainty, but let's put uncertainty and incipience in one block, that's uncertainty. And of course there are things that she doesn't even know that she doesn't know, famous unknown unknowns. Uh, for example, she doesn't know that there is a, a sword that can kill the monster. She ha I mean, even got the question about that. Uh, more diagrammatically, uh, she's informed when she has the question, the answer, and therefore she has the information in question. She's uncertain when she has only the question, depending on whether she has no answer whatsoever or she has a few answers, she doesn't know which is the right answer to that question. That's the uncertainty for you. And by the way, uh, if you discuss this with other people, they will hugely disagree with you uh, in terms of, oh, that's a really strange definition of uncertainty, especially the game theory theory people, uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense within a philosophical context. Of course she is ignorant if she doesn't even have the question and that's a, that's a good way of putting it for some students. I wish they had at least their question in mind sometimes. Um, so her uncertainty is a matter of power. Who puts those questions in her mind? Who later on can provide the answers to the questions that uh, she is and she isn't allowed to, to ask? So what kind of power is emerging within mature information societies? That's where I was trying to uh, explain the morphology of power comes uh, in terms of morphology of uncertainty. So power in mature information societies is not just about things. Good old days when uh, being a car maker didn't mean go and beg the government to be saved by, from bankruptcy. You were the guy who was influencing the influencers. No, no that was another time when the barons uh, in the states you now were running the system. Then we move to information about things and that's the Watergate scandal when uh, the Washington Post was not bought by the owner of Amazon was actually influencing the power. Uh, today I think is, uh, is about uncertainty namely the questions shaping the answers giving rise to information about things. The rest of the talk is uh, basically an attempt to defend this thesis but uh, just so that you have something to take home, uh, this should look, uh, sound uh, I won't tell you where it comes from, but it, it should really look and sound familiar. In mature information societies, those who control the questions shape the answers, and those who shape the answers control the reality. And of course it's uh, a rewarding on 1984, uh, about a few years the past. Why is that so? Well, in what way? In mechanism that make this possible? If that's even close to uh, truth. Um, 
First of all, we have already heard this. Uh, there's a mechanism called two-sided markets. American Express, Adobe, eBay, Facebook, Sony, Skype, Google, they all use that. Uh, it's well known, so I won't bother you. Uh, this is just uh, an email that I got uh, recently. Uh, in 2015, Uber, the world's largest tax company, owns no vehicle. Facebook, uh, the world's most popular media, owns own it, creates no content, Alibaba, Ebn, etc. <coughs> You've got the picture. I mean, uh, this is, there's no point in explaining this to this uh, crowd. Um, so these two-sided markets, uh, they don't own the stuff. I mean, they don't create the stuff. They, they're not controlling the world by the creation of things. And they don't, and I hope uh, now this is clear, they don't control the world. They, they are not great power because they create information. I mean, the difference between Wikipedia and Google is that Wikipedia has zero power whatsoever, uh, whereas Google, uh, and, but Wikipedia you know, puts the content there, whereas Google allows you to get the content. Uh, gatekeeper sometimes is mistaken as, gate, as information owner, not at all. I mean, in fact, these days, who is more powerful, the newspapers or Google in Spain, when it tells them, okay, I'll walk out of this business, thank you, and they go back, no, no, please, sorry, sorry, we were joking. Uh, we didn't really mean what we meant, uh, come back. Second mechanism, commodification in a Marx theory, the return of uh, the old guy. If you read just the bottom line, uh, instead of the long uh, things, it's making things unsaleable at some point, or not yet saleable, saleable. As assignment of economic value to something not previously considered in economic terms, uh, transformation of goods, etc., etc. Well, keep in mind this first thing, this first meaning of commodification. There's another uh, sense of commoditization in business theory, which is, again, if you look at the bottom, making saleable things, things that we're already selling and, and buying, so generic the customers perceive little or no value difference between brands or versions. I don't care which fridge it is. I mean, it's a white good. Oh, it's this or that. I mean, who makes it? Um, I, don't, I couldn't be bothered less. Now, these two mechanisms, and I'm getting to the point, get unified into a commoditization, first word, my own making, uh, which is a strategy that used the Marxist commodification of users as data subjects and the commoditization of goods and services in order to acquire and maintain power. Examples. If readers and books are commodited, then you want to make sure that those who control the controllers namely those who produce the books, are not really out of business, but no, dirt cheap. And that's where Amazon uh, has a real power on publishers. In fact, you know, the untwisting uh, policies of Amazon are, is exactly to make sure that the old great power, the power that was exercising influencing power on the influencers, which was the power of either owing the information or owing things, is you know, uh, undermined by getting, in, in fact, both things, cheap uh, goods, and information as cheap as possible. And of course, whoever makes books freely accessible, searchable, you know, is in a position of power. See Google and the digitization libraries. I mean, as I said, uh, Google is uh, supporting these uh, uh, workshops, so I'm glad. Uh, but you have to say, uh, how come that someone like, like Google wants to make books and all over the place so free? Well, surely, because they're nice guys. And, it's not bad, and because it does undermine any other uh, grey power which was based on having privileged access or even ownership of that information. If you are you know, my opponent and your ability to exercise grey power on society is linked to goods, then I make sure that those goods are almost uh, worthless because then I will be able to, through access to those goods, make my power more visible. And if your power is the power of information, then I make sure that you, the library, the book uh, seller, um, the journalist, uh, are not in a position of power because whatever uh, you can provide, anyone else can provide for free. This is not complete because uh, there is a third mechanism. Gift economy as a competing strategy. You need to make sure that all this is sustainable. But how do you do that? Well, uh, that's, that's a beautiful trick. And I, I know, hat off to uh, California for uh, having done this. You hijacked the gift economy. Uh, someone has to pay for this. If you make everything free, and I know it's not free, but I mean, dirt cheap, really cheap, cheap, cheap. 
the goods are cheap, the, the information is cheap. You pr provide only access to goods and, and, and uh, information. You are you know, the, the one who controls uncertainty. Well, someone has to sustain your business. How do you sustain your business? Well, you make it sustainable by the very people you are undermining. And who are these? These are the analog people. The analog people, the one, the guy who has to sell the white good, the, the, the fridge, has to pay you advertisement to make sure that his fridge is more visible. He has to play a signaling game. The signaling game it requires advertisement. I don't signal without signaling. How do I signal? By advertising. Who is in the advertising business? Well, this uh, new great power. So I give money to you to undermine me because the more money I give to you, the more power you have, the more my poor fridge, my poor book will be dirty cheap. So this wonderful system uh, makes sure that uh, the industry can, is kept uh, alive through advertisement, which is about uh, the uh, Swedish GDP uh, worth uh, every year. So that's the cake for which they are fighting, um, about $600 uh, billion. Uh, uh, dollars. Uh, the thing is that in this particular context, you also have an extra benefit. Because in the you know, two-sided uh, network uh, economy, um, the users don't pay for your services. Your services are, are paid through advertisement. Advertisement is a self-regulating industry, basically industry feeding itself. Well, the users are users. They're not voters because they didn't vote for it. They're not citizens because they have no that kind of rights. They're not customers either. I mean, I'm, I heard so many times the you know, standard reasoning. If you don't like it, it's a gift. You can walk out, get it somewhere else. You don't like uh, that particular service as an email service, don't that particular service as a, as a uh, say, uh, search engine, well, there are other people uh, you, uh, offering it around the corner. So this is the, basically the, the perspective, and you say, you know, some, one may think, oh, that's a lot of philosophy, not real uh, practical bite. So I think I can add a little bit of facts, but we heard enough today uh, th uh, to go in the same direction. September the 4th, 2014, the White House names Megan Smith, a Google executive, as its new chief technology officer, and Alexander McKillivray, a lawyer who had joined Twitter, etc., the deputy CTO. Now, these, if anyone, are people who are exercising a lot of great power uh, in, in our world. And we have already heard about the first quarter of 2015. Google became, for the first time, the company that spends the most money on lobbying the US, uh, U.S. federal government, surpassing defense contractors like Lockheed Martin and energy firms like ExxonMobil Corp. This is the way you look, having said that. Um, so this is uh, Google here, uh, and it was more than all the other uh, big guys that I mentioned. Uh, of course, I'm, not I'm talking about uh, companies. Um, having said that, uh, if we look uh, more uh, uh, down the road, uh, the second quarter, uh, Google actually spent a little bit less. And uh, if we look at the whole uh, perspective, uh, it's too far away to be read by you, but it's still the Chamber of Commerce that spends most of the money. Google is only number 10, but in terms of single companies, it's only Boeing and Gen General Electric that uh, come first and second. So uh, went down from being the first to being the third in the list. We're still talking about uh, a lot of influential power exercise uh, behind the scenes. So uh, conclusion is, um, there was a time when uh, we spoke about um, how life on this planet has prehistory. Uh, this is normally about 6,000 years ago when we uh, consider that uh, almost nobody had a way on this planet to convey current information to future generations. There was basically no writing. Uh, could have been something else, but writing was the technology that we invented. So prehistory uh, still applies to any society that is such that it doesn't have a technology today to make sure that information today can be consumed by generations far away unless you use sim simple biological not transmission uh, uh, biological memory. So there are a uh, couple of places uh, in the Amazonian uh, region that are still prehistorical. Uh, so it's not an age, it's a state of a society. We move from prehistory to history when we start relying on more intensely uh, on technologies that can convey, uh, re record and transmit uh, information to the future. So record and transmit is here, started about six years, uh, 6,000 years ago in, uh, in our world. And this means that uh, individual well-being and social welfare starts being connected to the presence of technology. Once you move, and that's us basically now, 
Once you move from history to uh, hyperhistory, this means that your re no, our reliance on technologies is not just a, a connection of welfare and well-being, it's a dependency of welfare and well-being on technologies. And this, uh, proof of this, is cyber war. Uh, it means that if a society can be put on its knees by a cyber attack, it's a hyper-historical society. So it's not the end of history, it's more history. We were historical, now we are hyper-historical. In this context, history, especially modern history, is the age of certainty and information as values. This is the, the time when, uh, no, from Richelieu onwards, no, your usual Kant, uh, is where, no, Descartes is all about reaching certainty 100%. If you're not certain, you're out of the business. But I would argue in a different context, because we come to an end now, the hyperhistory is the age of uncertainty, and those who control uncertainty control society. And shared ignorance is more uh, of a value than uh, information. Open questions, and that's the last slide. Politics between legal genesis and economic future, what is the human project? That's, that's our politics as we do it today. We either discuss it in terms of legal genesis, you know, some kind of democracy, etc., blah, blah, or economic future, uh, well, welfare, you know, GDP, growth, 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 innovation, etc. But the truth is that we don't have, as Western societies, hyper historical places, mature information societies, a real human project now. That's because of the lack of big narratives. We know that we have politics on demand. Um, we don't have a politics always on, no more. Um, we have moved from uh, opt out as a citizen to opt in. Uh, I normally don't care unless I'm motivated. Um, the marketization of politics uh, is going to play a big role in this grey power uh, organization uh, of uh, influences. And finally, all this is happening in a context where we know that is, there's a dematerialization of our culture. You don't buy uh, underwear, you buy in Calvin Klein. It doesn't matter what, what kind of underwear is. Uh, you know, you do, what you really care is the logo on it. Uh, it's super uh, dematerialized. And the trend from ownership, uh, property rights therefore, which is a classic in Brussels, to usage, use rights, which is not a classic in Brussels, because Brussels is stuck in, uh, no, in, in, in modernity. That's the question that we need to address. But with that, I thank you for your attention.